When I was a much younger man, me and the bloke I was working with that day were having a conversation, and in the middle of that conversation, this guy said, well, it's that thing of what happens when an unstoppable force meets an immovable object, because apparently that's how he spoke. Now, I can't remember what the conversation was about. It's probably something pointless just to get us through the day, but I do remember the question and the look on his face when I give him my answers. Now, before I share my solutions, I want to tell you why he had that weird look on his face. You see, the point the younger me didn't understand is he didn't want an answer. He was just using the fact those two opposing forces are a paradox to illustrate his point. In a way, him bringing up that paradox created a paradox between us. In his mind, he knew the answer to be right, while I was thinking I was right. While I was applying logic as a solution to his hypothetical question, he was happy to use this contradictory question without a solution to make a point. My possible solutions with the very limited information given to me on it was A. The unstoppable force simply bounces off the immovable object, changing direction instantly so as to avoid stopping. B. The unstoppable force passes through the immovable object. Or finally C. When the two collide, the immovable object ceases to exist. It being destroyed doesn't affect its non-moving rule. In my mind, applying logic from what had been taught through my life meant one of those answers had to be right. Applying cold logic to a problem means things can only seem one way, like a light switch, it's either on or it's off. But to miss the point of context is to fail at understanding the problem. Without defining the rules, so to speak, how can you apply any laws of logic? Without laws to define logic, logic just doesn't exist. I know that sounds a bit cat in the box, and if you're a kind of universal absolutist, you'll think a problem exists even if there's no one for it to be a problem for. The only thing we think in that way is you're starting to lean towards viewing the universe as some type of data. Presuming that laws exist without anything to apply them to is the same as viewing the universe as an all-powerful being who is everywhere all the time. Let me break it to you, if you do think that way, your god never even knew your name. Think of it this way. If I said to you, what is 1 plus 2, you'd say 3. You could identify that the law is first number plus second number gives us our result. But if you couldn't place something in those positions, there is nothing for the law to apply to. So does that law still exist? The answer is both yes and no, and we're back to the cat in a box. There is no magical record keeper who can apply the laws of nature to anything, unless you believe in a godlike deity watching over everything all the time, simultaneously. This got me thinking, if the laws of nature only exist when there's something to apply those laws to, then those laws must also exist as part of the thing they are applied to. They can't be viewed as separate. Let me make this really easy with a very simple example. You can apply your logic to check if it's correct. The answer I gave all those years ago, where I said one possible outcome could be the immovable object would cease to exist, we'll use that. Let's imagine this magical shield, which is our immovable object, it's the only one of its kind. So, as we know, the law stating it's immovable only exists while it does, as it doesn't apply to anything else. When our unstoppable spear hits the shield causing it to cease existing, the law also ceases to exist. So, if you were to tackle this problem with logic, you could say this object and its law existed for a period of time, and then, when the object was destroyed, so was its law governing it. You couldn't claim that the law governing the object still exists despite the object's presence because, as we said, they aren't a governing law without something to govern. Some of you will be screaming, Roller, you're very handsome but wrong. You see, natural laws are just rules that govern everything, like how gravity makes apples fall from trees or that friction will generate heat if you rub your hands together. They are just imaginary and are only a way for us to understand how things work. To which I reply, thank you for your compliment and tell you that your seemingly opposing view is part of the point. To think rules that are only defined by their ability to be applied to something are still the same when there is nothing to apply them to is trying to find logic from an illogical point. Whereas my logical solution seems illogical, Captain. So which one is the right answer? I mean, it's the only thing we're interested in, right? We want to know which viewpoint is right so we can be correct. Well, if you're not concerned with pushing a way of thinking and are only bothered about being correct, what if I said to you they were both the right answer? 
that these two opposing ways of viewing something are just two parts to the answer. You could no more pull them apart than discredit one for being wrong. Sounds like an exercise in double think, I know, but what if instead of looking to push your way, you instead bothered with being correct? Even willing to accept the opposing view if it was part of the answer. This brings me to my overarching theme of this video. Do we view paradoxes all wrong? Instead of being something that signifies a deadlock, aren't they just something whose answer lies in both contradictory statements? Just a thought.